So I'm up here to talk about MDOT training and uh, sharing of uh, best practices. Uh, what I'm actually going to focus on is uh, uh, what my area MDOT does to support our local agencies in uh, outreach and training. Uh, my area uh, is responsible for the entire state uh, as a maintenance resource. Uh, we develop bridge preservation standards and specifications for the entire state. Uh, we provide technical support to all of our regions, our bridge maintenance crews. Uh, we do the investigation of uh, new bridge maintenance materials and, um, and, and bridge maintenance methods and uh, we write special provisions for them and get those approved. We'll do a design and detail of complex maintenance repairs for our bridge maintenance crews. Uh, we're the liaison for the department with uh, industry for bridge maintenance. We develop training and we support our local agencies. We also are a department that has these crazy things called WIGs. I don't know how many other states do these WIG things, uh, wildly important goals. Uh, but I was given uh, the WIG of uh, partnering with local agencies, training local agencies, uh, going to conferences and presenting to local agencies, facilitating some employee swaps with local agencies where they'll send us an employee from their department to work on one of our bridge crews for the summer. And also we like to utilize, uh, MDOT has its own photo department and public outreach department to develop you know, public outreach videos. In Michigan we have uh, 83 counties, uh, all of them are uh, bridge owners. Uh, in addition to that we have uh, 261 uh, village, city, townships uh, that are bridge owners as well. Our uh, local agencies own 6,590 highway bridges greater than 20 feet. In Michigan, uh, we're required to inspect everything down to 10. So the ones down to between 10 and 20, they've only got 69 more. Uh, but they also have four tunnels, and uh, in Michigan, we're required to inspect and maintain our pedestrian bridges as well. Local agencies own 64 of those. Of all those 6,000 bridges, uh, 977 of them are structurally deficient. Uh, but what we were talking about yesterday is um, uh, we like to focus on preserving the fair bridges from becoming poor uh, and slowing down that rate. So you can see here a breakdown of how many bridges in uh, our local agency zone that have uh, fair decks, superstructures, and substructures. I really like sharing this uh, graph. In Michigan, this graph shows our annual rate of bridges falling to poor for the first time. In 1998, I, I've got the chart all the way back to 98, um, when we switched from a, more of a worse first to a more of a mix of fixes and committing at least 20% uh, of our budget annually to, to preservation. And uh, you know we've really started focusing a lot on our five rated bridges to keep them from going to poor. And you can see in 1998, we were between 140 and 180 bridges falling into that poor category every year. And uh, over the last uh, 20 years of doing preservation and focusing on our fives, we've been able to uh, slow down that inflow to statewide between only 20 and 30 bridges falling to poor. Um, this is just a great um, graph and something to keep track of in your state to support preservation and maintenance because you can show your legislature and you can show the public that you know these maintenance fixes we're doing is actually slowing that inflow into our poor bridge category and if we don't slow that inflow you're never going to catch up so i'm trying to emphasize this to our local agencies as i do outreach to them you know it's just not worse first you got to you got to hit them before they get poor and you got to maintain them. Um, additionally, my area will support our local agencies. Uh, we have two uh, statewide snooper trucks. Uh, our local agencies and their contractors and vendors can just call us and uh, get use of our snooper truck for free to help them with their bridge inspections. Uh, we also do some miscellaneous emergency repairs with them with our snooper truck. If they've got a, a full depth deck patch that needs to get done, real quick or uh, they've got a big uh, pile of debris in front of a pier that they would like to utilize our snooper for uh, to help them get rid of, we'll help them with that. Uh, Center for Technology and Training out of Michigan Technological University runs our LTAP program. Uh, they have an uh, annual bridge conference for all the local agencies. It's usually a two-day bridge conference. Day one is a workshop and day two is uh, more of a, uh, you know, that high level government stuff they want to talk about. But uh, for this year's day one workshop, uh, they asked my area to come in and talk about maintenance. So I had to put together four hours of uh, bridge preservation training for our local agencies and then facilitate um, our local agencies coming in and presenting the, the remainder of four hours of training. 
um, on best practices that they've been uh, doing. Um, this has kind of been leading me to uh, forging a lot of relationships with our uh, county, county engineers, our local agencies have been calling me a lot more. Um, over the past few years, I've been developing relationships with county engineers. For example, this Masaki County Road Commission uh, engineer likes to call me a lot. Um, he'll get inspection reports and uh, he'll want to just me to get like someone to talk to, someone to trust, uh, someone to you know bounce ideas off of. You know, we had a, this bridge here, 13 mile road over Butterfield Creek. His inspector lowered it from a six to a four. Small bridge. Uh, the inspector's comments, you know, severe map cracking, heavy spalls at the ends with cold patch at the joints. You know, it doesn't look like a big deal, but percentage-wise, the way we inspect bridges, it, it probably was a four, even though it doesn't look bad. Uh, but he didn't know what to do. You know, he's not a bridge engineer. He's more of a road guy. So he called on us to come out there, and we went out there, and uh, we helped him uh, sound the rest of the bridge deck, identify the necessary repairs he needed to make to get this bridge off of his poor list. And then not only that, we sent out uh, two guys from our North Region Bridge Maintenance Crew to work with uh, his maintenance guys to get the repair done this past summer. And uh, now this bridge isn't on his poor list anymore. Uh, another county that likes to call me a lot, uh, St. Clair County Road Commission. Uh, this is a, we do a lot of work with, with them. Uh, they're actually uh, been ramping up their program for a few years. Um, this is uh, Kilgore Road over the Pine River. Uh, they had an adjacent double T superstructure, and in between the double T's, all the joints were leaking and deteriorated and falling apart. The typical repair for this would be uh, latex modified or just a standard concrete seven sack mix. Uh, these repairs, though, are real limited. They're not very flexible, and uh, eventually they'll crack and leak, and uh, the reflective cracking will go through the HMA membrane and the HMA. So uh, we've been working with an experimental repair in Michigan, an ultra high performance concrete. So we, we suggested that they do that, um, use this ultra high performance concrete that uh, we're researching right now. I mean, it's experimental, but it, it should provide them with a better, long, more long lasting fix. So this is a typical DOT experimental project photo we've got here. More people than could actually fit on the bridge showed up for the job. Uh, we had St. Clair County Road Commission. We had the Road Commissioner. Uh, University of Michigan was helping us out with, uh, with the mixed design for the ultra high performance concrete. Uh, we had representatives from maintenance, concrete, and construction for uh, MDOT. And then uh, Anlon Construction was our first contractor in the state to work with ultra high performance concrete. They came out to give us a hand as well. Typical repair method for UHPC is uh, basically to fill up those joints with concrete and then you put these coffin lids over them and brace them down and uh, then you put fill up uh, these five gallon pails with uh, the UHPC and uh, that provides a pressure head of concrete on it and uh, to squeeze it into uh, help it flow into all the little crevices that were left in there. Here's just a few photos. You know, it was all mixed, uh, proportioned, weighed by hand. We had a fleet of co-ops out there and a thousand five gallon pails basically. Mixing all this and uh, putting it in wheelbarrow by wheelbarrow. And uh, at the end, um, like I said, we work a lot with the St. Clair County Road Commission. Um, at the end, they wanted to go back with an HMA overlay over it. So earlier in the summer, they, we had helped them trial uh, the Wasser Polyflex HA membrane system. So that's what you see here is, uh, you know, they're, they're putting that down as their membrane. A lot of local agencies have a lot of these uh, CMPs that are, you know, fairly large and they're 60 years old and they're just, you know, you know what they look like. They get all rusted out on the bottom and they start to get deformed. Um, so we're looking into the, the, the geo spray mortar. I believe there's a company here and they always talk about, you know, we'll run our sled through and we'll spin cast a geo spray structural mortar on the uh, inside of the concrete. Uh, so we've had a few local agencies, uh, we've uh, pointed them in the direction of those kind of companies to repair their CMPs. Uh, this one was uh, Waddles Road at the Rouge River in uh, Troy, Michigan, just north of Detroit. Uh, you can see upstream and downstream what those uh, culverts look like. These double culverts always work better to, to repair because you can divert flow through one while you're working on the other. Um, you can see this is just typical corrosion at the water line that they had. Uh, not a big construction footprint, just, uh, just a little semi-truck up on the shoulder or blocking a lane. And what's really funny is uh, 
Every company I've talked to about the geospray uh, mortar has talked about we run this sled through and uh, it does a spin cast and we come out to our first job and there's a guy in there spraying it on like uh, shotcrete and we're like, and the contractor that does it for these companies says, well, that's just cheaper and easier if you can get, if it's big enough to get a guy to walk through. So um, they install little tiny studs all over the place uh, in the culvert that set the depth so they know uh, uh, when they've got enough uh, of the geospray liner on there. Um, you can see in this photo, hopefully, that the, there's a couple of studs sticking out that haven't been covered up yet as a first pass of the geospray liner. And then here's the second pass. All of those studs are now covered up so they know that they've got the actual thickness they designed. Uh, this project finished out at $1,320 a lineal foot, um, which sounds expensive but is considerably less than you know, tearing up a road and replacing these and interrupting traffic because this was done in, in uh, I think, three weeks under live traffic. Farmington Hills also did the same thing. Uh, theirs were uh, significantly smaller, just 78 inch diameter. Uh, here you can just see, uh, again, typical corrosion at the water line. The diversion set up for the flow, they've just got it sandbagged off, so one's dry and the flow's going through the other one. And then once again, even at 78 inches, you just got the guy in there shot creating. We thought once again we'd see the, the sled, but nope. No sled yet, it's not small enough. This one finished out at only $427 a lineal foot, but once again, that's considerably less money for the local agency to spend than tearing up the whole entire road and diverting traffic. Uh, this project was done in two weeks under live traffic. And then when I was at my LTAP conference, uh, pre presenting on bridge maintenance, uh, I know that the DOT, MDOT, doesn't have a lot of uh, nail laminated uh, timber structures, but I knew in our inventory for local agencies, they had a ton of them because they're cheap. You know, they've got a lot of the tiny uh, small span crossings. So I just wanted to give them a little taste of uh, a project I had run on our one nail laminated timber bridge that the state owns. Um, basically what was happening with this nail laminated timber bridge was over time, the, the laminates and the nails back out, you lose your composite strength, and um, basically your timbers are acting as like little individual piano keys. This was discovered during a 2011 bridge inspection. Bridge inspector was out there and he had an oh my God moment. You know, a big truck goes over it and the bridge deflected quite a bit more than he expected. Um, so, you know, they called me because I'm the person they call when they've got weird situations. Um, they load tested it. Uh, they had a, a water truck at their maintenance garage. They put 2,000 gallons of water in it, load, uh, weighed it, and then loaded it, and it deflected uh, three quarters of an inch. So we had a, uh, a baseline for what we're dealing with and where the bridge is at. Then I did a lot of research. Um, the only thing I could find was the Ontario Ministry of Transportation uh, developed a, uh, a repair method for these bridges uh, by externally post-tensioning them uh, with a tendon on top and a tendon on the bottom. Just not tendons, post-tensioning rods. Um, and they uh, tensioned the bridge up to get 150 PSI uh, between each of the laminates um, and that restored the uh, composite strength of the bridge. The, the test deck they did actually shrunk the bridge width down by six inches. The def it reduced their deflections by 50% and increased the strength of the bridge by 100%. So the one, the one bridge we have uh, measured 24 foot two inches wide, only two inches wider than as built. So it hadn't spread apart a, a ton. So you can here see an elevation of our design. We've got uh, steel channels on both sides uh, with a tendon through the top and the bottom, um, exterior to the, the laminates. And then when we were done tightening it, we wanted to make sure it never came loose again. So we added uh, some glue laminated uh, spreader beams. Here's some photos of the construction. Basic process is uh, you'll tighten these up to, uh, I think we have calculated, in the, we, we, did, we tested in the lab that they needed to be tightened to about 300 foot pounds to get the pressure in between the laminates that we wanted. So what you do is you tighten it, your bridge shrinks, your rods get loose, you come back the next day, you tighten it, and you just do this until the bridge stabilizes and the, and the nuts stay tight. Uh, I think it only took a couple of days for this bridge. Um, and then we finished it off with uh, HMA overlay, waterproofing, and you can see here the spreader beams that were installed. The results, we had a three quarter inch deflection before, after we only had a quarter inch deflection uh, with the exact same water truck with uh, the 2,000 gallons of water. Um, so I gave this 
at the LTAP conference in March. And so this summer, St. Joe County Road Commission gives me a call and says, uh, we've got 55 of these that are like really <laughs> bad. So, so can you give us a hand with the first one? So I'm like, sure, I'll give you a hand with the first one. So, you know, I, I, I bought them the rod, took it down there for them because they were having trouble finding rod long enough uh, for their bridge and uh, gave them a hand with it. Um, you can see here uh, at their Heimbach Road, um, there's considerable spread in, the, uh, in between some of those uh, laminates. Uh, they spent several days getting all the rocks and dirt out from between those laminates. And uh, their load test got a three quarter inch deflection. I'm not sure what kind of vehicle they used. So they did the same thing. Uh, they, they wanted to get to about um, 150 PSI between the laminates. Um, use the same design as me. Their just bridge was a little bit longer. Um, so they had, I think, uh, seven of these or six of these channels uh, with the rods top and bottom. And uh, they actually had to tighten and retighten um, every day for almost a week. Um, their bridge shrunk uh, six inches in width. The only unfortunate thing about this presentation is we just did this like uh, a week and a half ago, so they haven't done their deflection test yet, so I don't have that result for you but I'm expecting it to be similar to uh, the bridge we did uh, with a, a dramatic reduction in uh, uh, deflection. And then lastly, I, I mentioned that uh, we have a photo unit at MDOT that likes to follow us around and uh, you know, make these little silly public outreach videos. You know, so I, I, I wanted to make sure I ended with uh, some kind of safety because I always have safety in my, I'm always looking for new safe things for my bridge guys. And uh, I didn't see anyone in industry selling any safety stuff. If I missed you, come see me at the break because I like uh, finding the new safety, safety gear for my guys. Hi, I'm Melissa Knopf from Bridgefield Services. And I'm Matt Navy with Statewide Sign. We're out here at M66 northbound over I-94 by Battle Creek. The Southwest region had their bridge crews scale the barrier wall. It looked to be deteriorating and it was found to be deteriorating due to ASR. There wasn't a whole lot left. So to protect the railing through the winter, MDOT statewide signs have installed temporary steel barrier. They come in 50 foot sections, so it's taken the crew a short time to set the barrier wall on the bridge. We did a buy for Michigan contract, picked the low bidder for the award with zone guard, and our crews installed this and the attenuators to protect the railing for the rest of the winter. And we're installing this here along both barrier walls until a construction project can be let next spring. So that's the kind of just silly quick videos uh, our photo unit puts together to uh, advertise, you know, because public's probably thinking, well, why are they putting this metal railing in front of this other railing? Uh, what I really like about this stuff is it comes with uh, a mash end treatment that you can buy. And uh, we needed 750 feet of this for the project. and. Uh, with it's such so lightweight and the way it stacks and ships we're able to get all 750 feet of it on uh, one semi on on that last application jason were you concerned at all about bolting that down into your deck i mean what are you going to do after when you take that up you know is there what are you going to do for your the new holes you just drilled into that deck we're just going to fill it with uh an epoxy but we weren't really concerned with those holes good presentation uh, I noticed that uh, and you're uh, repairing your timber deck, so now you're allowing um, the deck to be if rated four or whatever. After this repair, it goes up to fair or good or whatever, or you're keeping it the way it is based on this repair. I don't think the repair. I don't think the repair was meant for condition as much as it was. I mean. The, the, ins the condition in the inspection report. It was more for serviceability and um, load rating. I mean, I'm not sure I didn't actually think about the inspection report for this bridge. If they had actually, I didn't actually review the inspection report to see if it was rated a four because of the deflections and the, and the laminates pulling apart. So would not. you allow it though? I'm sorry, what? Would you guys allow? Allow for deflection? No, I mean allow it to upgrade. I would say I would say I'd be comfortable with them upgrading it. You know, if they if it got pulled back together and restored the strength and the load rating capacity. 
Thank you, Jason. The preceding video was produced by the National Center for Pavement Preservation. More information can be found at tsp2.org. That's tsp2.org. Additional support provided by Michigan State University.